This is the Wealth Ability for CPAs show. Better clients, better practice, better life. Here's Tom Wheelwright. So accountants aren't exactly known as the most strategic thinkers in the world. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we tend to start small and then get smaller instead of thinking big and getting bigger. And so today we're going to talk about strategic thinking. What is it? Why do we need to think strategically? And why is it that we fall into a trap of getting so small within our little world that we never think outside of it and what's possible for us, for our clients, and for our employees, those around us. And with us today, we have an expert in this field, um, Michael Watkins, um, professor and the author of The Six Disciplines of Strategic Thinking. Michael, it is a privilege and an honor to have you with us today. I'm just delighted to be here. Thank you. And if you would, uh, give us a little of your background and why sure. you're writing on this topic now. Well, so, you, you know, I, there was a book written about a random walk on Wall Street many years ago, Tom, as I'm sure you know, and my, my career has been a bit of a random walk too, right? So, but engineering and then PhD at Harvard Business, at the Harvard Business School in game theory and decision theory, believe it or not. Taught at Harvard for 13 years and then moved over to the IMD Business School in, in Lausanne. I'm probably best known for a book I wrote um, that's now sold close to 2 million copies, which is The First 90 Days, which is about taking charge in new leadership roles. And I sort of focused on that subject for many years and remained fascinated by you know the challenges leaders face taking new roles. But then strategic thinking came along and I just kind of caught the bug, you know, a little bit. And partially it's because I'm coaching leaders who are taking new roles and they need to devise strategies and move their businesses forward. <clears throat> and so naturally strategic thinking is a part of what they need to do. And, and I was seeing some people that were just like these amazing strategic thinkers. I was kind of going, wow, that's incredible the way they do that. And I'm seeing others where, eh, you know, um, it's not that they're terrible because you don't get to you know those levels without um, without being reasonably good at it, but there was clearly a difference uh, between the two. I should say too for the folks that are in your audience, you know, if you're either owning and running a business or advising people who are depending on your services, you know, I think that strategic thinking and helping them be strategic thinkers and providing strategic advice can be a real differentiator for you, right? So. I hope as we go through this, Tom, there's kind of connectivity a little bit to what your audience does as as trusted advisors of, of people in business and running their own businesses. No, I, I appreciate that. So what what um one of the things that's always bothered me is we talk about sometimes we I think mistakenly believe entrepreneurs and small business owners are the same thing. And and I think that the word small is the problem because an entrepreneur typically I see as somebody, I mean, if you look at the <clears throat> root of the word, as somebody who comes, you know, I, I lived in France for a couple of years, so I, I speak enough French to know it's really, you know, entering and taking control of a market. So you're thinking much bigger as an entrepreneur, small business is like, oh, I'm going to be small. I'm going to run my little shop. And the question is, I think the first question is, which do you want to be? Because if you want to be small, then maybe you don't need strategic thinking as much as if you decide, well, I'd like to do more. I'd like to do more for the world. I'd like to do more for my clients. So I'd like to start with really just defining, if you would, what do you mean when you talk about strategic thinking as opposed to some other kind of thinking? So I'll, I'll answer that question in a minute, but just one quick comment, which is given the rate at which everything is changing these days, I'm not even sure small business people can afford to not be strategic thinkers, right? I'm doing a lot of work on AI yeah. these days, Tom. And I mean, the way it's going to undercut businesses, create businesses, it's kind of astonishing. But anyway, um, strategic thinking, right? So I, I got interested in this. And so I'm, and I'm looking, doing research and looking and reading and what is strategic thinking anyhow? And it's kind of like, no one seems to have a particularly good answer, right? And I, so then I'm out talking to my clients and I'm talking to, you know, leaders that you know, people that develop leaders in large businesses and so on. What is strategic thinking? It's uh, uh, I know it when I see it. Right. OK, that's not a very good basis for figuring out how to develop people. And that's the real goal here. Right, Tom, which is 
I believe strategic thinking is something that can be learned. It's something you can get better at, right? Now we can debate how much better you can get. We can debate the relative importance of that early endowment or that experience you get when you're young, you know, as growing up. But regardless of wh where you are, you can get better, right? But we can't hope to give you good guidance on how to get better if we can't define what the world it is, right? And so that led me to doing a lot of interviews and a lot of thinking and eventually came up with this way of thinking about it, which is as a set of mental disciplines that you need to have, right, to recognize potential threats and opportunities, establish priorities to focus attention, and then mobilize your organizations to envision and enact promising ways forward, right? So that combination of recognize, prioritize, mobilize, to me is kind of at the core of strategic thinking. And then it's what, what does our mental machinery need to do to really enable us to do that, yeah? And that's where I came up with this idea and this framework of the of, of the six disciplines. And if you want, I can quickly go through them, talk about yeah, well, them. Well, um, let, let, me, let, let me go back just a second to the word yeah, strategy, sure. because uh, my favorite definition of the word strategy is a plan of action to accomplish a specific purpose. And so oh, good, good to definition. me, if, if, if that's our defi definition of strategy, then strategic thinking is thinking about accomplishing a specific purpose and a plan of action to do so, which I think covers a lot of what you were talking about there. Um, so I would For actually sure. like to walk through um, this, you know, your, your six disciplines, because I agree. I, I I think that there are people that are naturally strategic thinkers. I mean, I don't think anybody would ever argue that Elon Musk is not an amazingly strategic thinker. He thinks bigger than pretty much anybody's maybe has ever thought. Um, when he thinks okay. about putting people on Mars, he thinks at the same time of having universal Wi-Fi, and at the same time he's he's landing a rocket ship on a on a pad in the middle of the ocean and, and, it's and incredible. building, building car batteries, uh, uh, all at the same time. I mean, it, it's, that's probably what I admire most about uh, Elon Musk is, is that he's Absolutely. so big that, uh, you know, uh, I'm going, I wouldn't, it's almost like you wouldn't even dare think that big. Right. And, and so what is it that you think causes people, let's start with this. What do you think it is that causes people to think small, versus thinking strategically so just you know go back to your your wonderful example of elon musk right which is it's not like he's a dreamer only right he's not right. like he can just envision interesting things he's able to mobilize people and focus and and create businesses out of that set of insight right and i think that that's what the interesting combination i, I find is is that ability to imagine dream you know, see something, you know, up forward that you're going to shoot for and you're going to go for it, but then have the ability to really establish the priorities, mobilize the people to get there, right? And, and those to me, I don't limit strategic thinking to the dreaming, Tom. You know, I think the dreaming right. is important. Well, right? it's but a plan of action, the plan. right? It's a plan well, of and, action. And then, and then executing the plan. the plan, right? Right. No, for sure, right? Mobilizing people. You know, we'll, we'll talk about it later, but I include political savvy as one of the disciplines of strategic thinking, right? That's not something people normally associate with strategic thinking, but the ability to navigate the corridors of power, build alliances, you know, propel people forward in a direction, that's as important in my mind as the dreaming part, right? Agreed. So again, it's, you know, my, my effort is to try and put a, put a bit of a, a definition around what this thing is exactly. Well, let, let's walk through some of these disciplines then. We'll uh, we'll encourage everybody to read the details of it, and I think everybody will need to do that anyway. Um, and, and nobody's nobody's going to get everything that you know in a podcast. Um, but let's start with you know some of these uh, disciplines. I, I like the word discipline because I do think strategic thinking is an act of discipline. So uh, where would you start? Where do you start? Well, I start, you know, as the old saw goes at the beginning, right? <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that. Um, but it's, uh, you know, to me, the, the, the real foundation cognitively of strategic thinking is our ability to engage in pattern recognition, right? To see things in noisy environments and, and, and focus in on what is really important and what isn't, right? What signal, if you will, and what's noise, yeah? 
And I think that capacity to look and fairly quickly, you know, kind of say, okay, that's what's important about what's going on here, right? That's what we need to focus our attention on. If you don't have that pattern recognition ability, you know, it's going to be pretty tough to engage in any kind of strategic thinking capacity, right? You know, I I, I love that. I I I I that's <laughs> I talk a lot about that actually about pattern recognition and how important that is. So let's say you've got a bunch of linear thinkers, right? I mean, I I actually think pattern recognition is a little easier if you're a little nonlinear in your thought process, um, which is a little more right-brained. And we've got a whole bunch of people on the that are listening here that are left-brained. So how do you incorporate, how do you learn how to recognize patterns if you're constantly looking at A plus B plus C plus D equals E instead of looking at the kind of the, the, the cosmic universe of, of yeah. whatever you're looking at? No, it's 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 the right question, right? And I think that you're you're right that pattern recognition of the kind we're talking about is not A plus B plus C equals D, right? It's A plus F plus G gives us Z, you know? It, it's right. that connecting the dots capability. It's that ability to kind of open your your lens, like almost like a camera, or right? have a wider angle about what's going on. Don't immediately jump to conclusions, right? Take take a bit of time to think about what what is happening. Let it let yourself be immersed in the situation before you start, you know, uh, reaching conclusions. I mean, I think you know when you study people that have come up with great ideas, it's usually the result and the end of a long process of kind of um, stewing. <laughs> you know, uh, observing, absorbing, thinking, connecting, and eventually coming out with this kind of synthesis of something really new and different. I, I mean, I don't know Elon Musk's creative process, but, and maybe he just generates, you know, uh, amazing ideas, you know, by the second. But I suspect that even for him, there's a bit more to it than that. There's a bit more of kind of really immersing yourself pretty deeply in the phenomenon. You know, there's, the other thing is, getting information from lots of different sources, right? If you read the same one newspaper every day or go online to the same, you know, uh, website every single day and you're only absor absorbing information from, from that, the likelihood that you're going to make novel connections between things is very small, right? I mean, I, you know, he, he, Fred Smith, you know, um, founder, you know, of FedEx, used to read seven newspapers a day back when we read newspapers, right? instead of going online to get our information. But he, as the CEO of the company, thought that he had to have a, a wide angle lens view of what was going on out there, right? And he was quite gifted at connecting the dots and doing that. So I think one strategy is just open the lens, right? Make sure you're really absorbing information from lots of different good sources. I mean, you gotta be thoughtful about these sources you're going into for sure. Give yourself some time and be intentional about you know, space, you know, the, the ability to just give, give ideas time to come up rather than just kind of pushing yourself forward. Right. I mean, yeah. it's not an accident that lots of great ideas come to people in the shower. Right. Right. They really do. I mean, they really do, you know, it, cause you're sitting there, it's warm and you're kind of, oh, yeah, no, bing, you know, that happens. No, totally, totally question. The other thing are, or they come as we're yeah. waking up in the morning. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Or, 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 exactly. or they come while we're exercising. Um, we're doing something physical for me. It's the swimming pool. Um, that's, yeah, that's, no, actually, that's actually because the water, the surrounding water, um, you know, allows me to kind of empty everything else and lets things percolate. But one of my questions is that I think one of the challenge for a busy entrepreneur, a busy, a, a busy business owner is that they're busy. And yep. so the thing, what you're talking about, you know, how do you, how do you set aside the time for that? Um, and I have my own thoughts about it, but I'd like your thoughts. How do you set yeah. aside the time to realize that that's too. so important that it's worth setting aside time for? Look, let's start with the reality you just gave us, right? Which is we're super busy people. So we're not going to devote an hour a day to information absorption. We're not going to do that. Right. But maybe we can devote 20 minutes a day, or maybe we can devote five minutes a day, five times a day. You know, I, I'm a very big believer in incrementalism, right? You know, kind of carve it up, the mini habit kind of idea. 
um, you know, space it out, you know, take a break, you know, to do a little bit of that stuff, right? But, you know, the notion that you can't afford to spend 20 to 30 minutes a day absorbing information, I don't believe it, right? I mean, I, I, I just don't believe it, right? Because I guarantee you that unless you're, you know, uh, shackled to a machine that is moving you, you know, all the time, or you've done that, the equivalent to yourself, you, you can find the time to do that. Um, but what what were your what were your thoughts? Because I think it's super important. No, I I, uh, no, I do I I mean I do spend an hour a day. I spend at least an hour a day because it's my job. My job is the strategic direction of the three companies that I run. Um, my, I don't have another job, so so I actually get to, you know I've actually what what I found though is that I'm actually much more profitable. We're much more profitable when I'm doing those things, when I'm looking at it strategically, than if I were in the details all the time, because there are other people, I can hire people to do the details, but I can't, it's, it's hard to hire people. I can't hire people to think for me. And I don't want to hire people to think for me because every time I've tried to do that, it's, it's been a catastrophe because they don't think the way I do. I love I love you started with it's pattern recognition. This is something I've been I've been speaking from um, about from stage is that in the tax law, um, my job is pattern recognition. My books are successful because I recognize the patterns in the tax law, but it's only because I spent years and years and years studying the tax law. I, I mean, it didn't oh, like so. come to me because <laughs> I read it in no, the no. Wall Street Journal, right? Well, you're pointing out something else that's super important about becoming a strategic thinker, right? Which is immersion, deep immersion in a domain, like taking the time to soak into a, a domain the way you did with tax law until you begin to see patterns, right? I mean, the example I use in the book is, is chess, right? And grandmasters, you know, not that they win against machines anymore. That's a whole other story. But, you know, they see patterns in the, on the chessboard that novices right. just simply don't see because they've immersed themselves in the study of it, right? They don't need to think through every move. They can see the configuration, right? Much as the way you see, well, okay, there's something there in tax law that we need to hold on to, right? The other thing is, you know, working with people who are great strategic thinkers. It There is value in apprenticeship. I mean, it, it, apprenticeship is an old idea and it's kind of a, I think it's not given its due at all. Because really, there's so much you can learn from working with someone that that and and understanding the way they think, the way they see the world, right? You know, that's tremendously valuable. So, so I think we're getting into how you become a, a better at the pattern recognition piece of it, right? Open that lens out, information, right? Immersion deeply into that domain, you know, potentially, you know, taking the time and space to let those connections emerge for you rather than just hamster wheeling it around every day. And then if there's people you can learn from, right, to see the world through the lens of strategic thinking or pattern recognition. I, I, I love that. I love the apprenticeship idea. Um, uh, and I've been an apprentice many times and I, I love that. And I, I love to learn. So if you don't love to learn, it's it's pretty hard to do this, I think. I think that's actually one of the, the key characteristics that you have to um, exude is that you want to there, learn. There if you think no you know question. it all, you're you're done. You know, it, lifelong learning, growth mindset, foundational, right, to being a, an effective strategic thinker. The instant your your brain gets frozen, you know, something gets lost. Yeah, big it, time it's, it's over. You're listening to Wealth Ability for CPAs, not just because Tom Wheelwright is entertaining, but to become a better strategic tax advisor. Attorney John Scabland and his law firm, Scabland PLLC, presents with Tom Wheelwright to accountants and works with tax advisors throughout the United States, implementing strategic tax plans that protect the client's assets. Take your expertise and client value to another level by working with John. Tax professionals rave about John's approach to asset protection. John enables your client to start small and increase the complexity of their plan as their assets grow. John will custom tailor a plan that is both affordable and effective. John Scabland is your asset protection attorney who will work with your tax strategy and within your client's budget. Go to ultimateassetprotection.com and schedule a time to meet with John. Okay, so number one, pattern pattern uh, recognition. I love that. Um, I love that that's where you start. Where, where would you go from there? What's number two? 
Yeah, I want to be careful too, because I know we got some time limits, so I don't want to spend, you know, but let me step through maybe a couple and just see where yeah, it takes absolutely. us. Right? So the second one, it connects to the first one, which is systems thinking, right? Seeing the world through the lens of systems and not through the lens of simple cause and effect, right? We change A, it affects B, which then causes a feedback loop with C, which comes around behind and knocks us over the head, you know, with the club, yeah? And I think I was trained originally as an engineer, right? So thinking in systems terms was kind of drilled into me from the beginning of my education. And I don't practice engineering. I haven't for decades, you know, but it's still a useful discipline, right? What are the elements? What are the interfaces? What are the interconnections? What are the feedback loops, right? You know, when do we hit tipping points and all of a sudden things change dramatically? There's, there's just a basic set of ideas there that I think are really, really valuable. And here too, you can kind of hone your ability just by trying to step back. If you see something happening and it's and it's complicated, try to try to pull apart the complexity, right? What is going on here, right? And as soon as you start to think in terms of different elements interacting, you know, in certain ways, maybe in terms of feedback loops of varying kinds, you know, you start, it's it really amplifies your pattern recognition ability because. Now you've got like a, a an architecture within which to observe what's going on and to, and to build those mental models. That's a term we use a lot for this. Build those mental models that represent the way that the world works, right? And if you think if, if you've got models of the way the world works, then when you start seeing information from the outside, you can begin to contextualize and reach conclusions, you know, based on that information. Back to you with tax law. Tax, I'm virtually guarantee is a system it is and it's a system of interacting forces and elements and you press on a and something happens over here and so i'd be very surprised if you didn't have a systems view of the way tax works you know is that fair no that's totally fair in fact uh i i, I think it's critical uh to be successful that you do have a system view because the 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 patterns that's just that's just okay now i understand it but what do i do with it and the systems is to me is part of what i do with it because systems allow us to do the same thing over and over again right it allows us to repeat our successes and without the systems then we're reliant on individuals and individuals to somehow uh you know we've told them the patterns and now somehow they have to deliver that to the client. Whereas if we have a system for doing it now, you know, they, they, all they have to do is follow the system. All they have to do is, you know, here's Absolutely. okay. Now they can do a plus B plus C equals D because it's in a system for them. So I, exactly. I actually think that system. And if you look at going back to Elon Musk, if you look, look at Elon Musk, I mean, he's an engineer. I mean, fundamentally, that's his that's his discipline is engineering. And so he's naturally going to think once he saw sees the patterns is, OK, well, what's you know, what's possible here? You know, what are the patterns? What what are what system could we put in place? I, I've often thought that perhaps the greatest contribution that Elon Musk is making to society right now has nothing to do with satellites, rockets or batteries. It has all everything to do with manufacturing and mm -hmm. how he's built his manufacturing facilities because he's looking at things. I mean, just like when he talks about, you know, I've heard him talk about, um, well, he's looking at what's a simple way to make a car? How come, how can you buy a, a, a little matchbox car and, and, and pay 50 cents or a dollar for it? Well, because it's, uh, it's die cast. Could we die cast a car? Could we die cast a real car? And, and he started doing it. No, he actually, sure. he actually figured out how to do it. Manufacturing it's, it's a great die example. cast a real car. Right. And, and to me, all he did was he goes, well, he broke it down to what's the, what are the real patterns said? Okay. Now, how do we look at that in such a way that we can create a system from something that we do know um, rather than putting restrictions because of things we don't know? Exactly. No, and I think there's only one watch out, I think, in what you're saying, right? Which is because the systems models you're talking about basically get constructed in our heads, right? By those neural networks and so on and um, become what we call mental models. And that's incredibly powerful on one hand, 
so long as the world doesn't change <laughs> in a way that makes your mental models not so applicable anymore. And it goes right back to what you're saying about growth mindset and learning and unlearning, right? You know, you've got to continuously be testing whether your models are are still applicable or not, right? Because otherwise you're gonna you're gonna reach bad conclusions. So, so that's number two. Number three is what I call mental agility. And it was a bit of a smash together a couple of things, right? Um I, I had thought about writing separate chapters about these two things, but they actually, I think, are quite um, quite connected in the end. And I, by mental agility, I, it's literally what I mean, right? Your capacity to be agile in a mental sense. And the, the one of the examples of that is what I call level shifting, right? Which is the ability to go from the cloud to the ground and back to the cloud again. Um, and that cloud to ground thinking ability, but also the ability to know when you need to be in the clouds and when you need to get down on the ground and, and work the detail. That's a hallmark of strategic thinkers, right? I mean, and I think, you know, back to Elon Musk, right? I mean, I, again, I, I don't know a huge amount of, you know, of detail about how his thinking processes work, right? But I'm sure he spends time in the times in the cloud, but I'm equally sure he gets down into the detail, you know, when he needs to, you know? And the leaders I work with that I see being most effective are able to do that process, right? They don't get caught in the in the clouds. They don't get trapped on the ground, right? And they're intentional. That's a key word, intentional about how they move between those levels. And they teach their teams to do that, right? You know, we're talking to Bill today and, and you know, the team and the team knows Bill's in the, up in the clouds today. Not in a bad sense, but in a you know, let's we're we're focusing on the big picture, right? And then Bill says, "No, no, let's let's drill down into that, right? You're signaling that you're 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 getting into the real meat of something, and and teams, I think, need to know you're doing that, right? Because otherwise, you can really confuse them. So that's part A of, of mental agility. Part B is is the, you know, it's kind of the chess master move, counter move, thinking out a few moves, thinking back, and then okay, if I do this, they're going to do that, and if I do this, I'm going to do that, and so. You know, the agility is that ability to kind of think through the competitive dynamics of what's going on, the moves and counter moves that you're likely to, you know, face. Always asking yourself, what's the what's what's that player's? I use the term from game theory. What that what's that player's next move going to be, and what what would my best counter move be, and what could I do now to signal to them that they shouldn't make that move. Right. Because, you know, and that's the thinking process that, that you need to kind of go through. No, I, I love it. And moving back to the the, the cloud, you know, and, and the ground, I think um, in in our in my profession, uh, what you find is, is you find somebody successful at running a CPA firm. And so what they do is they become a consultant, but they sell their CPA firm. And to me, that that's mm -hmm. the big mistake. So I did that once. I I actually, you know, I said, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to deal with clients. I really need to focus on the bigger picture. We've got, you know, we've, we've got to, you know, deal with the education, the marketing, et cetera. But what I found was, is I lost touch with the day to day. And so I changed, I changed, I changed my, the way I, I was working. I'm going, I need to actually own a CPA firm. So I still do. And I still own a CPA firm, even though I run a franchise of CPA firms, I own my own CPA firm because I need to be actually, and I actually work directly with some clients, not a lot, but I need to be able to come down onto the ground and see what's really going on and how does this work from a real application. And to me, for me, there's been some magic there that you're, that now I can go back and forth because if, if I've like moved into the cloud, I can't get out of the cloud. Right. Or if I'm down on the ground, 100%. I can't get off the ground. I And I love that being able to move up and down. And I don't think if we don't move up and down, I don't know how we can be agile because we don't know what reality is. Exactly. When I think the, the point about running the firm, too, there's a whole nother benefit to it, which is it, it contributes to the learning process and tracking what's happening out For there sure. in reality. You know, I, I, you know, I coach senior execs, mostly taking new new roles right i will never as long as i'm breathing give up my coaching practice the part of the work that i do that's coaching because i stay in tune with what's going on in the business environment if you talk to ceos on a regular basis right you're going to see how the problems they face are shifting you're going to see how the factors are, are changing right so there's something that connects to your point about learning uh that i think is super 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 important here 
No, I love that. So, so, so for people who have a tough time going to your second point, which is yeah. anticipating the next move and um, whether you want to call it pivoting or uh, uh, agility yep. um, to yep. very similar concepts. Um, yep. People who are not comfortable with that, how do they become comfortable with it? Because, uh, you know, if, if you're used to A plus B plus C equals D, you're going to have a hard time going, well, wait a minute, my competitors over there doing uh, Z, S, and T, right? How, how do I, how do I adapt to that? Um, no, how, do, how do I deal with, with that change? Yeah. I mean, uh, for example, I mean, we got all this AI stuff going on and every, every conference I go to now with CPAs, they're talking about AI. I'm going, well, they're all worried about how is AI going to affect my business? I'm, I'm and I look at, I'm going, wow, what can I do with AI? So, so I'm taking yeah. a different, I'm taking a different view of it and I can't wait to get into the AI because I want to know, okay, how do I understand this so that I can actually help it actually help me pivot, help me be agile? It's it's a hugely important point, right? I mean, I think I have a son who's running a an AI startup in Toronto right now. And <clears throat> I, I he sent me to chat GBT the week after it was released, right? So I was in there pretty early and I got fascinated and I started writing about it and a fair amount. And you know, but the advice that the simple advice I give to people is get out in front of it or be a fatality, you know, embrace it. Don't try to fight it. Don't put your head in the ground because this is world changing. It's world changing, right? It's, it's really clear. And the, for the people that get out in front of it, the way you're describing, you will continue to thrive. You will, you know, but if you don't, you know, it, you're going to get run over. I mean, I just, it's just kind of that, that simple. You, you asked you about, how to do this. And so I, I, I was pulling up my phone for a reason, right? So I don't know if you can see this or not, but that's chess.com, right? Okay. And so my youngest son and I play chess all the time. Now, you know, it takes 10, 15 minutes a day, maybe max to do that, right? We make a move or two, the games can be played over three days. Games and puzzles are a great way to, to continue to build that kind of mental machinery, right? So, so and also just thinking through taking that step back the, the way I think you do, right? Of saying, well, okay, well, what, I've got these competitors. What are they likely to do, right? How are they thinking about the world? Step to the other side, right? Imagine the way they're thinking about the world. What moves do they think are feasible? What are they going to do? How would I react? How would I preempt them from doing it in the first place, right? That, you know, I was trained, you know, as a game and decision theorist originally when I did my my doctorate at Harvard and, you know, game theory's math is pretty limited, but it's mental, you know, kind of pat not patterns, but it's, it's concepts are hugely valuable, right? You know, action and reaction, best moves given the likely set of moves your opponents are making. And there are books, uh, I mentioned one in the, in the book that are basically about game theory, but for normal people, right? For business managers, there's some wonderful books about it, and it doesn't take long to absorb some of the key ideas. You know? So yeah, so that's that's the mental agility part, the cloud to ground piece, the chess master, you know, action reaction, think out a couple moves, you know, kind of kind of stuff. And then I, I'll skip through the other the other three kind of rapidly. I think um, so. Structured problem solving. This is one that <clears throat> I suspect your clients are not going to be that interested in, but it's really how do you lead teams through a process of framing and solving the most important problems the organization faces. And I've got an article coming out in the Harvard Business Review magazine with a colleague uh, in January that's all about how, you know, the, the tagline is how not to jump to solutions, right? How to think about how to frame problems from the beginning and, and be expansive and how you think about what is the real problem here which I think is a core, again, discipline of strategic thinking. The fifth one is visioning, right? We started with that, really, because you're, right. you know, your, your definition of strategic thinking kind of goes directly to that. But, you know, that, that sort of, um, there's a technique called backcasting, right? Which is, you know, imagine a destination and reason backward to, okay, what do I need to do to start getting 
heading in that direction, knowing that things are going to shift, right? But at least how do we get ourselves on a good direction? And there's both a discipline to engaging in the visioning, and there's a piece of it that is then about figuring out how you're going to build momentum in the direction of realizing the vision and pull your organization along with you. How do you, I, I use the term in the book, powerful simplification, right? How do you distill your vision into something powerful but simple that you can communicate? Because you've got to mobilize people behind you, right, to, to really make it make it happen. And again, there's simple little exercises you, know, you can do. There's one that I, I learned from a colleague many years ago, and it's called uh, the architect's exercise. And it's basically every time you walk into a room, you know, for the first time, uh, you know, a, a neighbor's place, a friend, uh, someplace in business, look around and think, okay, if I were going to redesign this room to be a better space, right? A more usable space, a more pleasant space to be in. What what would I change in the room? And it's just, it's just that, again, I use the term discipline a lot, right? That that exercise you do, right? To begin to work those those muscles in your brain that are ima about imagining possibility rather than, you know, kind of just converging to to the perhaps to you obvious solution. Um, and then finally, political savvy. And I, I said at the beginning, you know, that it may seem weird to do it, to add that. But, you know, um, my work in game theory and decision theory le then led me into negotiation. And I taught negotiation for close to a decade at Harvard uh, at the law school, the business school, the school of government. And, you know, the, the, the flavor of negotiation I taught was strategic negotiation, right? It's about how do you maneuver through complex political and social networks, right? How do you build alliances? How do you recognize alignments of interest? How do you work with people's agendas? How do you know something as simple as in what order is the right order to talk to people? Right. When do I talk to people one-to-one -one and when do I bring them together? Right. I mean, there's, and again, it's not, there's no rocket science here, right? But it is a mental discipline and it's a learnable mental discipline. And to me, you know, as I said, the, the first three of those disciplines, the pattern recognition, the systems thinking, the mental agility are mostly about how you recognize and prioritize what needs to be happening. The structured problem solving, the visioning, the political savvy are about how you mobilize people to go mostly mobilize people on where they want to go. So that's it. The six disciplines. I, I, I love it. Very, very simple. Um, the book is The Six Disciplines of Strategic Thinking. Uh, we, besides buying the book, which I'm going to encourage certainly all of my uh, people to do, uh, I think this is absolutely fantastic work that you've done, Michael. Where else can we go to get more information about what, you, you, what you're doing? In sure. So, so the best place probably to connect to me is through LinkedIn. I, I do my own LinkedIn connections and I always respond when people reach out. So it's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. Um, I, I sort of divide my life between IMD Business School on one hand and my consulting company on the other. I know this is going to sound familiar to you, right? That divided divided loyalty stuff, yep. right? The, the consulting company, which focuses more on um, transitions and teams and acceleration is called Genesis Advisors, if people are interested in that. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. And I, I think this is such an important um, topic uh, for CPAs uh, to really be focused on is stepping back, uh, you know, starting with the pattern recognition. Okay, so what do we even need to do there? And um, if you're unsure about it, if you don't know how to do this, if this doesn't come naturally to you, I'd recommend the six disciplines of strategic thinking. And I do know that when we are thinking more strategically, and we actually walk through, you know, the pattern systems, mental agility, solving problems, visioning. And then I love the political savvy part of it because that is that is actually all of this in action. Um, I think we will end up with uh, better clients and a better practice and a better life. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thank you, Tom. You've been listening to the Wealth Ability for CPA show. Better clients, better practice, better life. To learn more, go to wealthability.com.